for some complaining tonight. <laughs> We're going to talk about that powerhouse of complaining, King Saul, tonight. And then we're going to talk also about the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son and his complaint. Um, first, though, uh, let's say a quick prayer, and then we'll, we'll get started the study. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day. We thank you, Father, that you've given us all another day of life, that you've allowed us to come here and to study your word. Father, we pray that the things that we study tonight will be beneficial to us. They will help us to better serve you, to have better attitudes, and to do better in our relationships with, with other people. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us routinely that every day you bless us above and beyond what we need. Father, we thank you most of all for the relationship that we have with you, that we can go to you in prayer, that you forgive us when we sin, that we are children of yours. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um... Today's characters are a little bit different from the prior characters we've studied in that there are actually two kind of slightly different motivations we're going to talk about uh, complaining-wise. And I wanted to cover both of these, but wasn't quite sure how to fit them in, so I thought, well, we'll fit them into the same lesson, half a lesson on each one, even though they have kind of slightly different motivations. Um, so. We're still in the section of the uh, syllabus called jealousy. And so we are talking about jealousy, but we're talking about different reasons for being jealous tonight. So um, looking at somebody else's success is one motivation for complaining. Um, but then there's another motivation, and that is, what about when somebody fails and they recover? Do we complain about that, 
are we happy about that, that they've come back? We're going to talk about that, and I think you can guess what story that's from. Okay, so, first we're going to talk about the complaint. And this is funny. This is not Saul's complaint against David. This is Saul's complaint about David based on things other people said about him and David. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, They have ascribed to David then thousands, and to me they have ascribed uh, sorry, then ten thousands. And to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Now as I was looking for good pictures for this, because I've tried to include kind of pictures, but I came across what was uh, <laughs> very interesting. This is called Brick Testament, where they have Old Testament and New Testament stories, but in Legos. I'm sure this is exactly what it looked like. But... I think this is an interesting complaint, and to kind of understand this complaint, we have to go back a little bit and talk about the context. Um, who was King Saul to start out with? First king. He was the first king of Israel, right? And what led to him becoming king? People demanded. People complained, right? You see how often in the Bible complaints lead to other things, which lead to other things. The people complained. And what was their complaint? They said, we want to be like other all the other nations around us, right? We want a king to fight our battles, go out, do all these things. Um, and God says what to Samuel? He says, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me for being king. Right? So that complaint was not a complaint against Samuel. It was really a complaint against God. But God says... Here's what your king is going to look like. Your king is going to tax you. So you're not going to keep the fruits of your labors. Your king is also going to take what people he sees that are strong, smart, and he's going to take them away and he's going to use them for his own service. Right? And because he's a king, he can just do that. You're not going to have free will if the king wants you you have to serve him. Well, that's kind of what happens here. That's the start of this whole story with Saul and David. Um, Saul, for a little bit of background, Saul has a good start in that he, he comes to power, he saves the city of Israel, and the people anoint him king. And then God gives him a great task. He says, I want you to go and I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Right? And the reason for that was because the Amalekites had attacked Israel on the way out of Egypt. They'd attacked Israel. And this, God says, is their punishment. Now, did Saul do that? Did he follow God's instructions? No. Completely? Not completely. No, he didn't. What did he say to the uh, what did he say to the prophet Samuel? And Samuel said, Hey, what's, what's this bleeding of the sheep I hear? The people. Maybe. The people, right? We're gonna talk about that. There's a complaint there that uh, basically uh, negates his responsibility. But we're gonna talk about that later. But he basically doesn't obey God. And as he is talking with Samuel, Samuel has pronounced judgment, and he turns away, and that's what this picture is here. King Saul reaches out, grabs his robe, and it tears. And he says, God has torn the kingdom from you, and he's going to give it to someone else. And then we start the story of David, right after, next chapter. David is anointed king secretly in Bethlehem. Samuel goes out to him. Uh, remember Samuel's looking at all these sons of Jesse and he sees the 
the great sons, and God says, no, 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 no. Show me the last one. That's the one. David's recruited as a musician, though, in 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23. Does anyone remember why he's recruited as a musician? Yeah, the Bible says to soothe an evil spirit from, from the Lord. Saul had these headaches, and I guess David's music on the harp helped with those headaches. So David's recruited, and the text says, Saul says, go find me someone talented to play for me. And of course, they recruit David. Now, it's kind of apparent here that David splits his time between Saul and shepherding for his father. And we get that from 1 Samuel 17, 15, where it says David, after he became a musician for Saul, he splits his time, he goes, he shepherds, he comes back to Saul, he goes back and forth. But there's the incident with Goliath, then, in 1 Samuel 17. And there's David's subsequent promotion. You may remember, David comes to the battle, and he hears Goliath making his boast. He goes and fights Goliath, and he defeats him. And then Saul finally, and this is something I found, he asked, who is this guy? And like he didn't, didn't, didn't even, maybe didn't recognize him, or at least was just kind of like, hey, this is a guy who, who played the harp for me? This is the same guy who has now killed the Philistines champion? doesn't seem likely that to be the same guy. But then he's promoted. And so David starts going in and out with all the, the warriors, with the army. And they're coming back from fighting the Philistines successfully, who, as we all know, was, was Israel's major enemy back in that time. Philistines this, Philistines that. And here's where you have Saul's complaint. In 1 Samuel 18, verses 6 through 9. Because after David's come back and he's had this successful campaign against the Philistines. So what is Saul's complaint about? Well, on the surface, Saul is jealous toward David because of the attention he's receiving. And that seems fairly obvious. Um... That jealousy causes him to see David as a rival. Now, obviously I think if people are singing your praises and singing your boss's praises or singing your underling's praises and they're not the same, you're going to pay attention, right? But what's going on here that's really kind of below the surface? The scriptures say that Saul recognized that God was with David and had departed from him. And this made him fear David. And 1 Samuel 18, 12 uses the word fear. Now what's he got to fear from David? Is the question. He may be the next king. Yeah, he may, he may be the next king, right? To our should. knowledge... Samuel has told him, somebody's going to replace you, but Saul doesn't know who. David's been anointed in Bethlehem, but I don't think that's common knowledge at this point. That's a secret anointment. So Saul is kind of paranoid at this point, right? He's looking about for anybody and everybody who might be a rival. What's missing is humility from Saul. We're going to talk about why that is in just a minute. Was David an actual threat to Saul? Saul perceived David as a threat. But there's no indication that David did any of the things that were threatening. Right? I mean, Saul offers David at one point marriage to one of his daughters. Right? You think, well, that would kind of cement the relationship, make him less likely to rebel. David doesn't have men running before him, chariots, as we're going to talk about two people did later on, Absalom and Adonijah. From what we see, David is the perfect servant. 
He's not asking for anything more than he deserves. He's trying to do his king's will. He's not really a threat to Saul. But it's not about what David is. It's about how Saul perceives David as a threat here. Now, I thought this is an interesting exchange. I've, I've always thought this was an interesting exchange. In 1 Samuel 20, uh, verse 30, that Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame, and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. That's about the worst thing you can say to your son, right? You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Kind of feels there like Saul didn't have much respect for Jonathan's mother. Well, that's another issue. What we're trying to get to here is that Saul perceived David as a threat. And then people heaping praise on David was enough to kind of cement that in Saul's mind. But was David really a threat? No. David had two opportunities to kill Saul. Does anybody remember the circumstances behind, behind these opportunities? They were in a cave together and Saul went to sleep. David okay. cut his robe off in the corner of the robe. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, you know, some people have, uh, have the pastime of, of hunting big game animals. Saul's favorite pastime seemed to be going on David hunts. So he would hear David was at some place. Oh, David's here at these caves. David's here at this mountain. And Saul would say, it's time to go hunt David. So he'd take thousands of men with him, and he'd go hunt David. David would run. And by funny coincidences, Saul would end up exactly where David was, and David would have the chance to kill him. And on two occasions, David has the chance. At one point, he actually tears off a point or a part of the garment and then shows it to Saul and says, Hey, I tore this off your garment. I could have just as easily put a sword through you. And a second time, he takes the spear that's by Saul's head. And that's a very clear message. Like, hey, all I had to do was take that spear up and put it in you. So David had the opportunity to kill Saul, and he didn't want to do it. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think Saul uh, David was a threat to Saul physically, because he wasn't willing to do that. But he was a threat to the throne. I mean, he was a threat to, to Saul's power. People are, my people are out praising me, but then they praise some other guy, and they say, well, he's done even more than you've done. There's only a matter of time, you know, being carnally minded, where I think, all right, this guy may, he may start listening to that too and think, okay, let me let me jump in here and do something about it. But, I mean, you know, obviously he wasn't going to kill him, but that's what Saul was thinking, and it's not out of the realm of possibilities in his mind. But it does show you the problem with, you know, the first king, uh, because they wanted a physical king. The first one shows his flaws in that he's worried that someone else is going to take over, where they didn't have that issue with God. Yeah, they wouldn't have had it if they stuck with it, right? There's something interesting here that, that I want to kind of point out. This is the study question here. This is where you find the big difference between David and Saul. How did Saul not accept God's judgment on his kingship? And how did it compare to David's acceptance of God's punishments? Because I think you find in the characters of these two men, you find why Saul makes this complaint and that complaint leads to him being at war with David. And it's a one-sided war because David does not fight back. David just tries to escape, get out of his presence. He's trying to avoid conflict. Saul's the one who's, who's going for it. Saul was going above God's will and David trying to serve God's will. And yeah. How does, how does David accept God's punishments? There, there are two times I can think of that David was punished by God. Anyone think of those two instances? Bathsheba. And Bathsheba. Um, 
That was one of them. There's one other instance where okay. David is punished by God for something he does. Or are you talking about him not being able to build the temple? No, no. Okay. There was an instance where David decided he was going to number Israel. Um, Remember? He decides he's going to take a census. And this census is just vanity, right? And even Joab says, may the Lord make the children of Israel a hundred more times as numerous as they are, but why do you have to do this? In other words, God's taken care of you. Why are you numbering the people? That doesn't serve any purpose here except just to feed your own vanity. And David is punished for that. But let's look at both times David is punished here. This is the first time here, 2 Samuel 16, 11 through 12. This is when he's fleeing. Uh, this is when he's fleeing from Absalom. And you guys may remember, in fact, I don't want to talk too much about this because this is, a, this is another lesson here. But you guys may remember, this is when Absalom has just come into the city. He's basically coming into the city as David is leaving the city, going out across the Jordan. And David said to Abishai and to his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. You may remember that's Gera, the Benjamite. He's tossing stones and hurling threats and all sorts of stuff at David as David is leaving. Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. And this is the second one here. 2 Samuel 24, 14. God offers David, and this is, this is strange because God doesn't often do this. God offers David three choices for his punishment. Does anyone remember what those three choices are? In fact, it's like three multiples of three. Kill so many people. He says you can either have three years of famine, you can have three months of fleeing before your enemies, or you can have three days of pestilence on the land. Pestilence and plague. And David's response to that is, I'm in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So both times you see here that David is met with a punishment, does David try and escape that? Does he try to sidetrack it? Does he look for ways he can solve this problem here of God's, God's punishment? No. No, right? What does he do? He accepts it, and he prays that the punishment will be short and merciful, right? He had also begged for forgiveness a few verses before that, which is another mm -hmm, mm -hmm. distinct difference between him and Saul. Yes. Both times, both times, David uh, David asks for forgiveness, right? And you can tell that his, his heart has been hurt by what he's done. And he asked for, now Saul asks for forgiveness too, doesn't he? But you kind of get the idea that it's not real sincere, that it's just for show. But David, though, David accepts God's punishment, whereas Saul, Saul sees God's punishment, and he takes every step to try and work around it, get around it, and not let it happen. He's been told the kingdom's going to be taken from you, and from that day on, he is eyeing every possibility for how that's going to happen. He is going to outsmart God, right? And that's why I say, in my opinion, his complaint lacks humility. Because if he had just said, hey, I know the kingdom's been taken away from me, I made a mistake. But I'm going to serve out the rest of my days as faithfully as possible. Were there other kings that did that? There were other kings that God came down hard on. And when they repented, he said, okay, I'm still going to bring the disaster, but I'm not, I'm not going to bring it to you. 
right? This could have been a case where Saul lived the rest of his life peaceful, and there was a peaceful transition to David when he died. That would have been excellent, right? I would have loved to have read about that, but that's not the path Saul wanted. Saul wanted to keep his kingship as long as possible, and he wanted his kingship to pass on to his son, Jonathan. Even though God had said, that's not what's going to happen. Even though Jonathan didn't want it. Yeah, even though Jonathan acknowledges that David's going to be king. Saul has an extreme lack of humility. That lack of humility then, combined with jealousy, leads him to see David as a rival, which leads him to complain when people heap praises on David, which leads him then to take extreme action against David. So that's, that's Saul. Now, um, the prodigal son. I know we've had, uh, I mean, you could teach whole lessons on this parable. People have probably classes on it. We're going to focus, though, on the kind of the, the secondary character, which is the older brother. Now, the parable of the prodigal son is one of three in Luke 15, where you talk about lost things. You know, first you have the what? The lost coin, right? And it's one in, in ten. So one in ten. Then you have the lost sheep, <coughs> which is one in a hundred, right? And then you have finally the prodigal son. And the complaint here is by the elder brother when the son finally comes to his senses and he comes back. And the son here says, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. You know, I like this here. It's not when my brother came back. It's when this son of yours came. Kind of like how when our dog makes some sort of mess or something inside, Lauren's like, your dog has, has done this here, or your son has, you know, it's not his brother, it's this son of yours, King. Um, how does that compare to the father? Well, the father, when he saw the son coming back, Luke 15, verse 20, can someone read Luke 15, verse 20? Let's open up Luke 15, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Ah, his father saw him and had compassion. The elder brother on the surface, his complaint is basically jealousy that the prodigal son's receiving attention that he never received Although he's been faithful, and the prodigal son has not been. I think underneath the surface, though, what you have here is a lack of compassion, right? The elder brother doesn't see a lost sinner who's come home. What he sees is someone who deserves punishment, and yet has come home, and is instead receiving a celebration and happiness. And that's for his own brother. And what's missing there is compassion for someone who has messed up and then has come back. For someone who's lost and then is found. And that leads him then to complain about the attention that the prodigal son's receiving and the fact that he's not receiving it at all. Now, kind of a question here. How does the parable of the vineyard laborers in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16, parallel the problem with the elder brother. And I want to read this, uh, I want to read this parable here, Matthew 20, uh, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. 
And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Now, the third hour would be when? About 9 a.m. or so? Going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at their master, at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. What's similar in it's, that peril? Yeah. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair, right? It's not fair that these people have been sitting idly all day, and they only had to work one hour, and the rest of us have had to work 12 hours, and we all receive the same thing, right? What more, though, is there that's lacking from that assessment? I mean, yeah, it doesn't appear to be fair, but master of the house says what? You agree to a denarius, so you got one. It's my money. I can pay people whatever I want. You agree to a denarius. So it is fair, in essence. What's missing from those labors at the very end, though? What, what is a denarius? A day's, a day's wages. A day's wages, right? And did these people just make all sorts of money where they had savings accounts and <laughs> stocks and bonds and leftover? No. No? Right? So what's, what's happening to people who can't find work then? Start hard. <laughs> They go hungry, right? So it's not, it's not like these people who are standing idle all day are on vacation or something, right? The cost of them being idle all day is they don't have a day's wages. They may not get to eat, right? And the people who work the whole day, they're guaranteed a meal for the day, right? So what is there missing in this complaint, then? Some compassion. Some compassion, right? Some compassion for these people who have a job. It may not be the same number of hours, but they've been paid and they get to eat for another day, right? There's a huge lack of compassion on these people. And that, I think, kind of parallels the story of this elder brother, in that both stories, there's a complaint that is born out of a lack of compassion for the people who have an opportunity. Any any comments on that? Yeah. I thought it was interesting, especially in the, the two main stories that the, the prodigal son and Saul. Yes, there was a lack of compassion and even in this story, there there is an advantage. But in those two, they they had everything. So to sit there and be jealous, you know, the king <laughs> is jealous of his harvest shepherd. You know, I mean, I understand he's seeing this God's favor and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, he's the king. And then and the you know the prodigal son, and that's that's his father's rebuke is, you have everything. Let let me give him a welcome home party. You know, like stop complaining. So especially in those first two, when you have everything and you have the advantage, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard for us now with the, the bird's eye view to frankly have compassion on them. That, that, is a, that is a very good point, and that's actually one of my future points, so, uh, Sorry. so thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Let me know no, to that's a good it. point. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. Um, 
Well, also, Might as well talk about that right now. That is something that both the stories have in common, don't they? Is there is a comparison to somebody else, and there is a, a lack of looking at what I have. Saul is the king. He's the king anointed by God. He has everything, and yet he's jealous of this harpist here. And the prodigal son is the same way. Uh, the, sorry, the elder brother is the same way. He's jealous of this prodigal son who comes back, who now has no inheritance, right? Everything that's left is his. And he's still upset. You know, when his father passes away, he's going to have all the goats and fatted calves he wants, right? And he's still comparing himself with the son who ran away, and he's not happy about it, even though he, he has everything. Um, well, he also may think that his dad will still split the inheritance somewhere. <clears throat> he may think that. He may well, think that. I, <coughs> yeah, he may. The older son may think that. Well, and the dad puts that to rest. He says, everything I have is yours. But he may have thought that. But it's the comparison, though, that I think is is there, that's the problem. Um, there's a famous quote by Theodore Roosevelt. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. And that's, that's very accurate, right? When you have something good and you start comparing yourself to other people, what are you going to find? Somebody always has something better, right? If you are king of Israel, and you have absolute authority, there is this one person who is receiving some praise that you are not, right? And if you're that elder brother, and you've been faithful all these years, and everything your father has is yours, there's that son that comes back, and he gets a celebration. He gets one celebration. I don't think they're gonna continually celebrate him being back for the first few. He gets one celebration. And this brother sees that, and there's a comparison. And all of a sudden now, there's no joy anymore, right? Comparison is the thief of joy. Um, very true. Okay. What's an appropriate response to those who repent? Forgiveness. Well, to be very happy. Forgiveness, right. But... Luke 15 tells us it's joy, right? Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And finally, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So there's two different attitudes you can have toward people who, who repent. There can be the joy that we should feel for someone who has come back. Or there can be... What other attitude? Well, jealousy. Not jealousy but... Maybe jealousy. There can be resentment, right? <laughs> there's definitely resentment with that older brother. And there can be jealousy, though, that someone who has come back is receiving all this encouragement, receiving all this attention, and here I've, I've been faithful all this time, and nobody comes to me and asks me how I'm doing, or, you know, heaps praise on me for, for coming back. There can be that sort of, there can be that attitude that leads to, instead of joy, at least to resentment, jealousy over people who repent. Now, how do we have compassion and mercy on other people? What's key to having compassion and mercy on other people? Contentment and humility in your own situation. Right, right. Well, I'm thinking specifically. And, and we received it from God already. Right. It's important to remember when we're trying to have compassion and mercy on others that we remember how much mercy and compassion has been shown to us, right? 
And I love this parable that Jesus tells. He tells this in the house of Simon. He says, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. <laughs> so what's Jesus' point in saying that? Do we really owe God different amounts? Do, uh, do, I owe, do I owe less because I have sinned less than, say, Brad? You now I pick on Brad. <laughs> do I owe God less because I've sinned less than, than somebody else? No, it's the same sacrifice. No, it's, it's the same cost, the same sacrifice, it's the same gravity, right? of what we've done when we've sinned. But what's different in people's minds, though? Yeah? God's going to appreciate it more because he's like a sinner. <laughs> 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 you started something here. <laughs> it's, it. it's how we see it, isn't it? Yeah. It's how we see how large our sin is and how much we owe that really determines whether or not we have compassion on other people, right? If I think that I haven't been forgiven a lot, then I'm not going to want to forgive a lot to other people. But if I see my sins for how enormous they truly are, then when other people are forgiven, when other people come to Christ, when they are found, that's going to lead me to want to extend mercy to them the same way mercy has been extended to me. I'm going to show happiness for them the same way that happiness has been shown for me. And that's really, I think, the key here to the elder brother. He lacks compassion because he doesn't think that he's been forgiven much. He even says that, doesn't he? He says, I never disobeyed you. Come on. What son is there that has never disobeyed their father in anything? Do we have any of those people here? No? He's obviously exaggerating. Maybe he never did anything major, but that's kind of the point, right? He doesn't see that he has been given very much, that he's been forgiven very much. In his eyes, he's lived a perfect life. And so this other son who comes back by comparison in his mind you know he doesn't have to show him mercy because he hasn't been shown any mercy himself that's how he that's how he feels all right um, well that is basically the lesson and it should the bell should have run by now I feel like <laughs> We can make that happen. Yeah, we, okay. Push the button, you push it over the bell. Yeah. Um, any comments? <laughs> there we go. Any comments on what we've talked about tonight? Actually, in Luke chapter 15, with the three parables, it's because they were complaining, this man receives sinners and eats with them, and not us. Yeah. Well, the so other thing is, the, young, the prodigal son says, uh, you know how how my father's servants have plenty to eat and you know all the goods you know that they have and I'll just go back and say you know I'll be your servant but the older brother doesn't realize how like you said how good he has it I, you know just just the way he lives is is a wonderful way to live and he doesn't recognize the blessings that he has already. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of compassion, but there's also, I think, a gratefulness there, Great. isn't there? And the elder son gets a double portion of the inheritance. Yeah. No. What, what I think we find is that there are a lot of different motivations for complaining, and there can be multiple at, at work here. Uh, I think the challenge that we have today is we tend to use somebody that's repentant 
skeptically and say, well, well, are they truly repentant? I'm going to keep my eye on him. And, and, and perhaps I told you, you know, I knew he wasn't truly repentant kind of thing. Be ready to pounce on him should they falter any way along the way. So I think that's kind of a challenge that we yeah. face today. And that's not real compassion, is it? To, to watch people after they repent and look to see that they're not going to do it again, right? That definitely goes against what Jesus says. If your brother sins against you and comes to you, you know, how often are you supposed to forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus says up to 70 times seven. In other words, they come back, you, you accept them. Yeah. And accept their repentance at face value, not skeptically. Yeah. Well, and so back to Ron's point, you know, the context of Luke 15 is that the Pharisees were grumbling about Jesus receiving sinners and eating with them. So the Pharisees didn't even want those sinners to get forgiven. They just wanted to separate from them and have a bad attitude about them. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many times complaints in the Bible lead to lead to things. They show bad attitudes. Alright, well, that's the class. Thank you guys for coming tonight.